Good morning, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today and joining us from all different parts of the world. I know most of you used to come to our events when we used to host them in New York. And I know that we had a lot of supporters from the youth. So I would like to give a shout out to all the youth who have joined. Please go to the chat box and say, I am here and then write one word, what we expect from this event. And those are not so youthful, but they have a youthful nature, also write in the chat box. I'm here too, and also say which word, one word, what we're expecting from this event. My name is Kawis Moyu. I'm director for the gender office at World Food Program. It is my privilege to welcome you to this uh, virtual webinar and really to be here with you and to thank you for the support you have given us. We have incredible program. We have people uh, joining us from, from far. We will hear about lessons we have learned from this program. From Gifford, we hear about the impact of COVID. And then we have our gold star partners, Norway and Sweden, who have stayed with us throughout these years. We really thank Norway and Sweden for their support. So I want to say that there's going to be translation. You'll be happy to hear that in French and Spanish. Please look at the right side of your, uh, of your screen where it's written in the present and choose your language. At the end of this uh, the event, we'll try to accommodate questions. Maybe we'll have time to take two or three questions. Now, we, I am so proud to introduce the key no speaker today, Anita Biatia, who is the Deputy Executive Director of UN Women. We are sorry the ED of UN Women and to cancel the last minute because of another event. So without a lot, uh, without a lot of do, let us hear, let's give the floor and the screen to the Deputy Executive Director of UN Women. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of you and women, it is a great pleasure for me to be able to offer some opening remarks on the occasion of this event on accelerating progress on economic empowerment of rural women. This pilot partnership between you and women and the Rome-based agencies, IFAD, FAO, and WFP is unique. And it is a wonderful example of one United Nations in action. Working together across a range of countries in Ethiopia, in Guatemala, in Kyrgyzstan, Liberia, Nepal, Niger, and Rwanda, we have seen that when we bring the full force of the United Nations to work together, we can have measurable impact on the lives of rural women and, and on their livelihoods. We have reached over 75,000 women and affected positive change in their families and their communities, touching almost half a million people. We can be proud of this partnership. We have worked on discriminatory social norms and on addressing structural barriers that hold rural women back from enjoying fully their human rights. This is an important agenda of work and it must be continued. We will not be able to achieve the 2030 goals without paying attention to the needs of rural women. In most of the countries where we work together, the agricultural sector and the informal sector form a very large part of the economy. It is vital that we address in a climate friendly way those constraints that have held back rural women for centuries. These include access to productive resources, property rights that allow them to use and collateralize land, access to better inputs for productive work in farming, access 
to information, production of information asymmetries, as well as access to markets for goods once produced. All of these sorts of issues are the very issues that this joint program has been seeking to address. It is therefore vital that this program be continued. I would like to share my appreciation for the support that we have received in this partnership from the governments of Sweden and Norway. And I would like to encourage all member states who are watching this event to consider not just extending the support to this program, but to joining it, to amplifying it, to scaling it up, and to really work jointly with us and the Rome-based agencies to achieving measurable impact and change in the lives of rural women so that we can address not just the long-term structural issues that have existed for a long time, but also the newer issues that we have seen in the wake of the pandemic. Ladies and gentlemen, the pandemic is going to push more women into poverty. We knew even before the pandemic that poverty was feminized. It has become much worse as a result of the pandemic. And many of the women who are affected are in fact rural women. We must work with a sense of urgency to turn their lives around. Please join us and the Rome-based agencies in enhancing the possibilities of this program and in so doing, changing women's lives. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anita. Such inspiring words. I want you to put these words in your mind as we go along with this with FN. Unique partnership, wonderful partnership, one united nation in action to deliver and yet they deliver measurable impact. All our partners and donors are looking for measurable impact. This program is delivering measurable impact. I'm also so encouraged to see so many of you going to the chat box and telling us what you expect from this event. You expect to hear more on how we are assisting rural women. You expect to learn. And I can tell you, we are not going to disappoint. Now, we are going, uh, don't listen to the word as we go along, but slowly and slowly as we go through the event, we will provide you with evidence why this joint program is so effective and so impressive and why you should you support it, both in advocacy and also telling people about it and joining to say, you want to throw your, your, your input in it and you want to support it, monetary. So now we are going to, to, to see a video from Guatemala to see how indigenous women are joining this program, working with it and what is the impact on the ground. Watch with me as we, we join together to watch the video from Guatemala. Thank you. Direct descendants of the Mayans, the Quechi people are the largest indigenous group in Guatemala. Predominantly subsistence farmers, they see agriculture as both physical and spiritual, where the act of planting is also an act of creation. For many years, Quechi people have suffered social and political marginalization, and Quechi women face considerable barriers to education, employment, health, and opportunities. Due to inequality, women's plots are small and often located on slopes and degraded soil. They are also excluded from decision-making and community development processes. The Joint Programme on Accelerating Progress towards the Economic Empowerment of Rural Women is supporting indigenous women and their families in Alta Verapaz region in northern Guatemala, helping them to maintain their unique culture while promoting their economic empowerment. <laughs> Empoderamiento, se escaba el 
Nakanabali sutam ut aheni runak chishponi le kanachin de ish te shenau karuli narah mit karuli na sikli seraan re nak chiri bildri ne gesta viru le karu ne geshe salirati no male ut salikati no male sa komuni Ensuring that their culture and traditional knowledge is valued the joint program provides training on climate smart agricultural practices adopting traditional techniques and promoting the nutritional value of native crops. By supporting income generating activities and setting up over 250 savings groups, women are gaining financial independence and through education and training, they are participating more in family and community matters. <laughs> Since 2014, the joint program has supported over 7,000 women and 38,000 family members in Guatemala, empowering indigenous women through transformative social and economic change to help ensure that no one is left behind in the pursuit of gender equality and the realization of the 2030 agenda. Incredible impact on the ground, incredible impact. And now moving on, I'm so happy to introduce my colleague Susan Carrier from FAO, who is a big supporter for the three Rome-based agencies, learning together, working together, and even playing together. And Susan is going to give us some examples of what results are coming from our work on the ground. Over to you, Susan. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kawinzi, for that excellent introduction. Uh, definitely, we do play together quite a lot. Uh, I'm going to uh, there we are. I'm going to share my screen and uh, um, so thank you. Uh, what I'm going to do is very quickly go through some of the key results and good practices that we have uh, achieved so far, and these are results that have come from a global evaluation of the UN Joint Program. Um, I will not belabor this. I think uh, we know it's the four agencies. It's implemented in seven countries. I, the, the Deputy ED for UN Women has already mentioned uh, the reach of the program. Uh, so let me go here and talk a little bit about uh, what, what are the four outcomes of the project. The project actually has uh, focuses on improved food and uh, food security and nutrition through increased productivity, increased income to sustain livelihoods, enhanced participation and decision making at households, community and policy levels, and also more gender responsive policy environment. And this is as a way of responding to the multiple challenges facing rural women. So the global evaluation uh, was carried out by a company called Mukoro Limited that was selected after an intense search and an and assessment. Uh, and the, uh, the evaluation focuses on uh, six years between 2014 when the project starts implementation to 2020. And it involved a mix of uh, collecting primary data, but also secondary data. There was in-depth document reviews, uh, various stakeholders, both global and national were interviewed in the seven countries. There was online survey. And then this, the evaluation was also conducted on the ground, collecting primary data in Niger, in Guatemala and in Nepal. While in Ethiopia, Kyrgyzstan and Liberia, it was a desk uh, and Rwanda, it was a desk study. And the whole idea of the case studies was to make sure that we're providing you know, understanding what the context was, the program design, what had worked, the implementation, but also pulling on good practices and lessons for future programming. 
So what I'm going to present is a, it's just a snapshot. There, there was a lot of results, but we just picked a few. So in terms of improved food security and nutrition, what did the women and men report? So uh, we found that women, uh, the report found that women had adopted improved production technologies leading to increases in agricultural productivity. Um, the program provided livestock and other times women were able to buy livestock which provided manure, therefore increased yields. Women reported using their savings or credit to buy additional land, therefore increasing their production. Uh, access to nutrition services and training actually led to improved diets, but the improved diets also came from availability of livestock, the meats, the eggs, or from the kitchen gardens. And then women also talked about a reduction in work burden due to food processing technologies. In terms of increased incomes, uh, what did we hear? Uh, there was uh, the, the community reported the use of these new approaches. So in Kyrgyzstan, the use of business action learning for inclusion methodology helped women to diversify and move away from traditional female uh, microenterprises to much more broader uh, market opportunities. Linkages with much larger scale markets such as the World Food Programs, Farm to Market or the P4P, very useful for the women. But also there was increases in access to financial services through different models. So there was the Rusakos in uh, Ethiopia, uh, the rural savings and credit cooperatives. There's a VSLAs in Rwanda, mobile banking in Liberia. All this has enabled women to save, to access credit and to expand their businesses. But women also reported this, uh, the, this business development training, the literacy, numeracy training, really led to an improvement in their business and agriculture skills, but also in their own confidence. So this gradual, this process of gradual economic autonomy was seen amongst women who now have cash, can contribute to household expenses, have, new, have gained new skills and employment opportunities. Um, the, the third area is around uh, leadership, voice, leadership and participation. What women talked about is that through the learning, the, the leadership training, they've gained self-confidence, self-esteem. They're taking on leadership roles in the community, in cooperatives. Uh, women talked about increased in, the increased income has also impacted on their status. They, they are now comfortable to speak up. They are asked questions. And, and also they are capable of educating themselves on farming and food consumption practices. Women also reported having found voices in political spaces. In Kyrgyzstan, they talked about being elected in local councils in Nepal as well. And one phrase that was really interesting for Nepal was they said, women now know that they have to be involved in planning processes at ward level, and they have to approve the plans before they go to the, before they go to the municipality. In terms of policy, uh, catalyzing a gender responsive policy environment. There's several things that come out across the different countries. The first one is that across all the countries, the program has supported the integration of gender in agriculture strategies and policies. In Liberia, they talk about supporting the formulation of the Land Rights Act, which has been signed into law, but also supporting and creating awareness of women to advocate for their rights and to claim their rights of a customary land. Uh, in Ethiopia, they've created a national network for gender equality in agriculture that brings agriculture related sector stakeholders to discuss issues that are important for gender, but also to share knowledge. Uh, in Nepal, uh, the program helped the review of the gender equality and social inclusion strategy that is now also supporting its implementation. And finally, in Guatemala, uh, the program supported the Ministry of Agriculture, Livestock and Food to develop its first institutional policy on gender, but also supported the establishment of a national gender unit. So what were the key things that we think were so crucial in catalyzing this change? We, we see two ingredients. Uh, one is organizational capacity, the collective action. And the second one is approaches that foster social change. 
In terms of strengthening organizational capacity, what we found is that these women's farmers groups, whether they are cooperatives, self-help groups, produce organizations, or VSLAs, one excellent entry point for program interventions. And the formalization of this group has actually led to great access to resources from government and from other uh, partners. These organizations have really also helped to uh, enable access to savings, to credit, but also to collective bargaining power. Um, in terms of social change, what has come through and what has been shared is this use of gender transformative approaches have led to positive changes either in women's roles or in the behavior of men. So we have approaches such as the Dimitra Club, the gender action learning system, the community conversations have all really been used to foster change at household and community level. And they've changed the perception of women's roles and their rights. You know, women are seen as income earners, as managers of enterprises, decision makers, but also having a right to participate in development processes. And men have also reported on an increasing role in household chores. And of course, the joint household planning processes. So what, uh, what have we heard about what is, has made it work? Several different dimensions. The first one, we know for sure across all the countries, it was alignment with the national policies. So making sure that it's actually contributing to achieving the national uh, policies was important. Involvement of government ministry. The program has worked very closely with the ministries of agriculture, ministries of gender. This has been really crucial. But in addition to that is making sure that we are working with local institutions and structures so that we can ensure capacities remain at the local level. Uh, there's also been the increased income for women in women's hands, which has enhanced autonomy. But for this to actually have the impact we wanted, the engagement with men and with normal holders to also support women's economic empowerment has been crucial. And the last dimension has been the collaboration and the partnership between us, the agencies, but also with the other partners in country. Um, so how do we, how does this come together? Uh, and th this came out across all the different, uh, um, all the different countries and uh, how they, they would talk about, so how has change taken place? And uh, what we find is that it's this combination of inputs to the same women but bringing in different com components that actually has generated this change. And that women have systematically reported on positive changes in income, nutrition, entrepreneurship, rights awareness, investment in children's education, but also male behavior change. And when we look at it, how do they say it's happening? Access to training and new technologies led to increased production, which leads to diversification and access to new markets, and this increases income and of course, better nutrition. And then by women having this income, they contribute to household expenses. And this also begins to increase their status in the house and they can contribute to the decisions. And then it also shows that all, to all actors that women are capable to participate in local development processes. So what lessons have we learned? And this is my last slide. Um, I'm sorry, but although we'd like to give you the whole list of challenges, we picked just a few that we thought were very important. The first one is a policy change takes a lot of time, requires government commitment and government stability. When there are changes in government, sometimes this has taken us back. Investing in government ownership at the subnational level, working together to implement activities has been crucial to contribute to sustainability and policy implementation but requires intense capacity development. Uh, we have found that working with the most vulnerable beneficiaries requires in-depth long-term support to realize outcomes. That we found that uh, while joint programming produces efficiency gains uh, and reduces job duplication, it requires intense and strong coordination all around. Uh, when the program started, we did not have climate change integrated. And we think that it's really important to bring in climate change right from the design of the activities from the beginning. 
And finally, the area that we think is really important is around monitoring and evaluation and knowledge management. When, as we had it, different countries had different types of M&E systems and knowledge, and this did not allow very good comparison across countries. So we think a uniform joint approach to M&E and knowledge management would be really crucial going forward. Thank you very much. Over to you, Kawizi. Thank you, Susan. That was fantastic. I mean, it is just incredible to see how much the joint program has achieved. Better nutrition, better markets, better access to finance, better uh, services, and leadership. I really like that idea of leadership because this month we have been celebrating International Women's uh, Day, and there's this theme of leadership. And to hear this program, and current and the women got out of it having better leadership skills that is incredible and also it's important to hear that they got voice to take part in politics to be part of the planning of the country this is incredible just imagine that giving rural women voice and ability to make their own decision so the the project is doing so well so now we have witnessed COVID. All of us know what has happened around the world. Some of us are, are people who are sick. Some of us have lost people. COVID has had such terrible impact around the world. And it has also had incredible, terrible impact on rural women. Just imagine this, for them, they had to walk longer to collect more water needed to remain healthy. They had also to walk longer to go to find for food. And they had probably to walk because they did not have resources to take transportation. So the burden to them increased so much. They had also to deal with unpaid care work, to look up the sick one. We know that around the world, COVID has made such impact on gender equality. And now we're in danger of all the gains which we have made being eroded. Now, I'm so happy to introduce another incredible colleague from IFAD, Stephen Yogia, who is going to tell us the impact of COVID on people we work and what happened. How did these people raise up with resilience to cope with the impact of COVID? Over to you, Stephen. Thank you very much, Kanzi. Um, let me also share my screen with you. So um, as we have heard, COVID, and as we know, COVID has, has impacted the lives of all of us. Um, and as we heard in the opening remarks, and as uh, reminded also by Kawinzi, it has had a disproportionate impact on certain groups, and especially rural women. So today I would like to share with you um, how the COVID pandemic impacted the, the rural women involved in the joint program, how they reacted, and what lessons we can learn from, from that experience. So to start with um, how it impacted the joint program, so we saw an impact on four levels. Um, so the first one relates to COVID awareness and prevention. And um, there we witnessed some initial skepticism regarding the real danger of uh, COVID in some places, which led to um, communities not fully following the government uh, guidelines. And on the other hand, we also saw that there was uh, insufficient access and availability of uh, uh, hygiene materials such as soaps, masks, etc., for preventing the spread of the virus. Um, a second area of impact relates to income generation and livelihoods. Um, so there we saw reduced access to markets, um, also increased, increased uh, prices of products um, and decreased uh, purchasing power from uh, for uh, rural households. Um, there's also a temporary suspension of businesses 
and reduced production. And most importantly, we saw uh, reduced incomes and a loss of savings. A third area of impact relates to food security and nutrition. Um, so there we saw a disruption in rural women's agricultural supply chains. So with regards to seeds, uh, fertilizers, etc. There was also uh, reduced access to agricultural extension and overall reduced access to food. And then finally, a fourth area of impact relates to gender norms, gender roles and social norms. Um, and there we saw an increased incidence of uh, violence of men against women, and particularly uh, domestic violence had intensified. And there was also increased teen pregnancy um, and increased uh, women's work and care burden due to lockdown and quarantine uh, measurements. Um, and also the education of girls was deprioritized. So now how did women uh, respond in, in the joint program? And again, uh, we will look at that in four areas. So the first is again uh, related to COVID prevention and awareness. So there, and there was, uh, we, the women started using ICTs uh, for awareness raising um, on COVID prevention and treatment. Uh, but also there were uh, gender specific health mess messages, um, access to practical information and just sharing of experiences. Secondly, hygiene kits were uh, provided to households, which included masks, soaps, etc. And overall, there was compliance with, with uh, COVID-19 prevention measures in all program activities. Um, secondly, with regards to income generation and livelihoods, um, so there, uh, for example, um, in, um, in Kyrgyzstan, um, ICTs were used for training, so they were held uh, virtually to support women's groups, but also to engage with local authorities and other partners. Um, what we also saw was that uh, women started to uh, adapt their businesses to new needs, for example, in Kyrgyzstan, so you can see the, the woman in the picture where they started producing face masks, or in Guatemala, where they started making soap for mass production. Um, also, market delivery was adapted. Um, there, for example, in um, Nepal, uh, fresh, fresh produce was delivered uh, at home instead of at the market. Um, there was also use of savings to cover basic needs, so from the savings and credit groups, um, the provision of loans from the women's groups, and there also conditions and terms of, of the the loans were uh, adapted and overall uh, families were able to withstand the shock and sustain their businesses. Um, a third area relates to food security and nutrition. Um, so there we saw that um, specifically also in Liberia that uh, people and women source nutritious food items from the, the community grain reserves. Um, also uh, the home grown gardens, uh, the vegetables and fruits grown there uh, were used to, to cover the household gap and reduce food availability. And then finally, with regards to gender roles and social norms, um, there we saw that women really took a lead in disseminating um, COVID-19 uh, information within their communities and also acting as um, role models, um, that especially in, in uh, Niger. Um, also, women started lobbying and working together with local authorities, um, so to make sure that their voices were heard in the response activities, um, but also that they're aware of other, uh, other um, actions taking place in their communities. Overall, we saw a sense of collective solidarity, and men started supporting uh, their women more with the burden of care and unpaid work, especially in Rwanda. So we've uh, seen that uh, the COVID had a, an impact on the women, but that they've also been uh, reacting to that in their own ways. And what can we learn from this experience? So uh, the first lesson that we've learned from this experience is that it is important to always incorporate a resilience lens in women economic empowerment. And as um, uh, Susan said, like at the beginning, uh, the pro joint program was developed in 2012. So that resilience lens wasn't incorporated at the design, but with increasing um, climate change and also disease outbreak, it is very important to always include, include that uh, resilience lens. 
A second uh, lesson relates to the holistic approach of the project. And um, the holistic approach was really very important as it helped to, uh, women to withstand economic shocks, but also um, to um, challenge the social norms and that women can take more central roles in their um, communities and response activities. Um, a third lesson relates to um, business development and that it's always very important to include business adaptation training in business development so that um, uh, women can adapt their businesses according to the, the context. Um, a fourth lesson relates to engaging men um, and that is uh, very important not only to uh, contribute to more equitable intra-household gender dynamics but also to um, foster greater community acceptance of women's inclusion in community response activities. And then finally, um, it is also very important in relation to business development skills to also carry out uh, leadership trainings. So those were the, the main lessons that we took from, from this experience. Um, and now I would like to um, show you a video with the testimonies of uh, different women and how they reacted to the COVID pandemic. Thank you. I do the I do even bomb fair. I do even bomb fair. I do I I get to Matunochi, I take a Paka, I have very much the Kalbam Bora, Kulmudu, Kobayaga to Mara. Il Paka, a Kutambo, Ilka, Unga Dino, Ildan, Irigine, Ildan Higine, Ilneto, Somo Il Paka Arabo, where I saw a Bombay Bora, Kuludo Hare, Ilgate, Ilquara, Ilkohepo, hey, he knew what come by Tasinia, come Igoma Akani, in a Ilkois, Ilka, Paka, Unga, say, Unga Mom, look very much like Tepuada. रले न त करोना के टाइम में की करैत रहलै महिला हिंसा के लागि मार पीट करैत रहलै छोरी बुवारी सब के पुरुष सहन मारैत रहलै न त हम सब की कहली ओकरा घर में गेली ओकरा सब के समझैली सिखैली मार कुट कुट मार न करे के पर छि मार पीट न करे के पर छि कह के ओकरा सब के भी कहली माफी मांगू कह के आ सहन मिल मिलाप कह के रहू सब गोरे से कह के हम सब ओकरा सब के समझैली During the COVID-19, our business broke down. For, for the women that we are rich in the group, everybody volunteered to pay how much she able to pay for their share. We, we put it aside that when anything happened to any one of us in the group, we take out something and go and solve the problem. Kela oli kana chin bas kena kisho kana chit sabso sali ochat la o kachi masako el kengi le kachampo sali. The <laughs> Galstigentrin <gülüyor> Ariko mu gihe kitari cya Covid mu gihe gisanzwe cyambere yari guhinguka gakaraba akitemberera hakanga banyirize imvune amirimo nari gukwari 34 
hakora ibiri na gakora ibiri nuko no byayindutse ntago wabona umuntu muri gufatikanya byose Thank you, thank you, Stephen. Thank you. If there's one thing we, we can make sure it works, is building resilience for rural women. We build resilience for them, and then people don't have to come and work for them or try to assist them. Resilience, resilience is very good for everybody. Now you have had uh, from the four partners, UN Women, FAO, WAP and AFAD, and how incredible this program is. But I'm wondering, what do our partners and donors think? Do they think this same? Do they think this program has been wonderful and effective as we partners think? I am so pleased that today we have Norway and Sweden who are going to join us in the second section and answer some questions, what it means, why is this program important to them. From Norway, I have Yang Skutnes, who is Deputy Permanent Representative to the UN Organization in Rome. And from Sweden, I have Eva Johansson, Lead Policy and Advisor for Gender Equality at CIDA. I'm going to start the question with Sweden. And before I start the question, I really want to thank Sweden for the event yesterday. The event you ordered uh, for women in crisis, it was incredible, it went so well, it went brilliant, I thank you. So now Sweden, this program has been possible because of generous support from Sweden and Norway. Why is this program so important to Sweden? Over to you, Sweden. Thank you very much and thank you also for sharing some of those best practices and examples today and I think they really showcase how gender equality if you apply a holistic approach uh, and work in complementarity with others uh, can really drive results and lead to better development outcomes for, for all and reach also more. Now I think the joint program has really been important to, to see that ever since it started in 2014, uh, but the importance of strengthening rural women's economic empowerment is really more important now than, than ever. And the COVID-19 pandemic uh, comes with several risks of backlashes like we've heard today on women's empowerment overall, including economic empowerment. And we also see the climate change can seriously affect women living in rural areas um, and their resilience, both financially, socially, environmentally, is really an obvious priority that you have also captured in the program, which is really good. Um, and uh, there, are the, there are not really potential risks, but really a reality. And we've seen the pandemic and the climate change seriously affecting the joint program and target groups in 2020 and beyond 2021. Um, and I would also like to say that the situation we are in now with the poverty levels increasing as a consequence of the pandemic, lockdown and the socioeconomic stress on ourselves and individuals and on societies, um, another 47 million women are at risk of being thrown into extreme poverty in 2021 alone. Probably the number is going to be even larger. So it's really... Uh, an important uh, program uh, for us. And uh, it's also um, a, a support that it really contains potential for replication and scaling up beyond the program itself. And, uh, and for Sweden, for Sweden, uh, inclusive economic development and improving conditions for women's economic empowerment, it's a really key priority. And uh, as you also may know, uh, Sweden is also co-leading a global action coalition for economic justice. And this global action coalitions uh, are a response to the call for the Secretary General to accelerate action for gender equality to achieve the sustainable development goals. And Sweden is co-leading the one on economic justice. And uh, as we also 
know, uh, these action coalitions are going to be launched at the Global Forum in Mexico at the end of March, so very soon. And, uh, and for the, uh, inclusive economic development and gender and, and women's economic empowerment uh, has also become uh, a really core cornerstone of our gender equality work. We have uh, our second uh, gender equality plan, action plan. We have uh, once again put uh, women's economic empowerment at the forefront. And uh, we are also concerned that uh, that the average um, uh, number of 2% of bilateral development assistance only is going towards women's economic empowerment. So we are concerned about the low, low generally the low contribution because it's really important and makes such a significant change to the lives uh, of women and families and rural economies, uh, but also makes an impact on uh, sustainable development as a whole. And, uh, and women also, they play a major role in the rural economy as farmers and workers and entrepreneurs, uh, but also face uh, really strong uh, constraints engaging in economic activities because of social norms and gender-based discrimination, but also the unpaid care work and unequal access to resources and financial services uh, that you also already mentioned today, education, healthcare, and other services. So uh, I would say that uh, rural women, we can also see them as, uh, as the key agents for driving the transformational changes that we need, the economic, environmental, and social changes that we are required if we are going to achieve the SDGs. But, um, uh, but beyond this, uh, just to reiterate again that rural women, their empowerment are really key to enable and drive the sustainable development. And uh, we, it's really critical if we are going to meet the SDGs. Um, but as a program, uh, the joint program is not, uh, it's not only about women in rural areas. It's really an interesting program built on evidence gender equality has direct implications on food security and nutrition, on, on development and poverty. And it's something that we can no longer afford to ignore. And uh, that's why this program is so important to see that for, uh, for some of those reasons. Um, and uh, the holistic approach is uh, not working in silos. Um, it's really something that we need to look more at and learn uh, more from. Uh, and it really comes to the root causes also, social, um, social uh, individual political power. Um, another also being the joint and long-term efforts that many actors come together to create a lasting change. And we need to work on this together with a long-standing commitment. It's really an achievement, and I would say perhaps a blueprint also for local development. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sweden. Thank you so much. That is just uh, incredible to hear such support and testimony about this joint program. I'm now going to Norway. Can I ask you, what is your assessment of the joint program model as an approach to achieve women's economic empowerment. Over to you, Norway. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, Norway is really, we are really proud to, to support the joint program. We strive to be a, a, a strong global voice for gender equality, and, and this program really helps us to, to walk the talk. Um, the joint program is a good way of working because it's answer to the quest to the UN system to deliver as one. And it gains from a coordinated approach between UN Women and UFAD, FAO and World Food Program. So um, as um, I think, as Eva said, the, it offers a holistic uh, support to tackle structural gender inequalities. And that's, that's really important. And it's a, it takes on a really big and difficult task, but I think this is the only way forward. I think it's also important to note that the program was designed through consultations with the governments, with rural women's group, with youth groups, with farmer organizations, uh, and also other UN agencies. And this has given a, a solid partnership. 
And I also understand that the structure of the program has enabled uh, broad information sharing and given better decisions on priority activities and uh, the allocation of funds. So, so I think uh, all this had built uh, an ownership and a potential to replicate the successful model in other countries, as previous speakers have said. Um, if you allow me, if I should say a few words of what should be strengthened, and I've heard it before, it would be that the capacity to coordinate must be even better. Uh, and the other thing that is really important is the monitoring and, and reporting that has not been fully satisfactory. Uh, and this is important to improve first and foremost for the women that the program is supposed to serve. Um, so we can learn and adjust the program. But uh, of course, as a donor, Norway needs a good monitoring system in order to make sure that the money we invest gives the results. Thank you, Esther. Thank you. And it is, I mean, it is so important for us to have the capacity and serious also that we monitor and report back. So this is something where even for us, the UN agency is a priority. And also all our partners are saying we want evidence, we want better monitoring and reporting. So thank you so much, Noe, for that uh, intervention. And now for, I'll go to Sweden for another question. Now, Sweden, the program has been unique partnership between UN Women and the three Rome-based agencies, IFR, FAO, and WP. Can you tell us how can UN working together and delivering as one contribute to the global learning and gender and strengthen women's economic empowerment globally? Over to you, Sweden. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, as, uh, as you know, Sweden is really a strong supporter of the UN reform and, and also in delivering as one uh, the agenda to, to be really to make interventions more effective and coherent and coordinated and, and get better results. I think the joint program is, is, uh, is an opportunity in a way for UN agencies, possibly beyond the UN also, to really learn from each other and have a learning approach and to adopt new programming approaches and incorporate those learnings into the wider work of the agencies. So um, in a way, uh, one can see it as, I mentioned the word blueprint, but maybe a showcase for the UN reform because what's interesting about the program, and it's, it's really not about UN agencies competing or working in silos. It's really about coming together for the benefit of beneficiaries and for really for, for the local development. And, um, and uh, in that sense, uh, it can really showcase also how by using uh, complementary um, expertise, resources, experiences, uh, how they can you know, work, work better together. But it's also equally important uh, for the joint program to, to, to look at what it's aiming for, which is really about strengthening women's economic empowerment and to accelerate achievement also the SDGs in general. So that outcome is it's really, um, uh, going beyond just a collaboration as such. Uh, but despite uh, seeing the growing, I think, uh, research based on evidence and knowledge on what specific interventions really empower women, it's still limited. So there is a need to have those uh, systematic uh, strategies and to measure empowerment, to learn. And as my colleague from Norway said, to replicate and to scale what works. I think this is something that we have picked up and learned from this joint program, uh, where solutions are developed in the actual local context uh, across the seven countries, and then inform policies and lead to revised methodologies at the global program level. So it, this learning focus is quite interesting. Um, so uh, it's also relevant beyond the UN, as I mentioned, for others also working to strengthen women's economic empowerment. Um, and uh, so, uh, the, so the joint program, we see it as very well positioned uh, to spread the lessons learned and inform interventions, uh, strengthen women's economic empowerment beyond the program itself. Uh, 
And uh, one example is uh, that Sweden is uh, supporting now the Committee on the World Food Security, which is currently developing the voluntary guidelines on gender equality and women's empowerment. And this process could uh, very likely benefit uh, also from the experiences of the joint program. So we really hope that there's an opportunity for that also to happen. So thank you uh, very much. Thank you, Sweden. And as you know, the, the three Rome-based agencies are very much involved with the voluntary guidelines. And we mm -hmm. hope that people will come to see this program and use some of those ideas to strengthen the guidelines. Yeah. And now, uh, going back to Norway, after everything we have heard today, in context of increasing climate change, pandemics, and why I say now we are dealing with that, WP has started calling the three Cs, COVID, conflict, and climate change. Can I then ask you, why in this context of conflict, COVID, climate change, why, why is it more critical than ever to prioritize rural women economic empowerment? Why is it so important now, more than ever? Over to you, Noe. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I take it that very many of those who attend this uh, seminar know that women and girls are more exposed to the effects of climate change and pandemics as a result of the barriers they face, very many of us face. And, and you know, the fear is that uh, 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 women risk being even further left behind in the current situation. They will, uh, especially for rural women, they will be backed by discrimination and by social norms, and they will face great challenges, poor nutrition, lack of access to productive resources, and limited participation in rural life. And, and as we, heard, we saw in the video, um, women might also face exploitation and violence uh, in this situation. Uh, and at least uh, climate change will affect the livelihoods of millions of, of uh, women. So the COVID uh, pandemic has uh, reminded us that the response to global problems need to be sustainable and, and inclusive. And we, we are supposed to, to build back better. This is a slogan here everywhere and we must ensure, ensure that this response uh, provides benefit for both women and men boys and girls i think kind of to answer to your question that this program has uh, has showed us that when women are placed in the center of development intervention they have the capacity to to, to respond to cope and to adapt so economic empowerment for women is really about building resilience to climate change and other external shocks, for the benefit of women themselves, their families, and for communities and for nations. Thank you. Thank you very much for just putting that uh, emphasis on those uh, the COVID and climate change and how they're affecting women and girls all over the world. Thank you so much. And now I have a question for both of you, and I'll start uh, last Sweden to answer first. Sweden, what would you say to member states participating here today regarding the need to come together and jointly support such a UN initiative to realize rural women's economic empowerment? What would you say to fellow member states who are here? Over to you, Sweden. Thank you very much. Well, it's really our strong hope that, uh, of course, uh, I can't speak on behalf of Norway, but um, on behalf of the uh, our seed at least, uh, that we hope that additional jo uh, donors will join the joint program to continue and expand this very important evidence-based um, um, joint work that are achieving what we find uh, from the evaluations and from your reports and our own field visits also as very effective and inspiring results. And uh, we really believe that it's time also, and particularly to, 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 to boost support for women's economic empowerment. I mentioned the global action coalitions, but it's really about also the three C's you mentioned, COVID-19, conflict and climate change, and to build back better and greener and to, to, to push the sustainable development agenda forward. 
And uh, so we are really pleased to see this emerging results. I think we are, um, we've come a few years now down the road. We've stayed with the program and uh, it's, it's because we, we think it's really achieving uh, results and, and, and has possibilities and, uh, uh, to, to boost women's economic empowerment. Uh, so, um, so I think that's, uh, that's what our experience is and, and we can encourage others to, um, to look uh, more in depth into the, the results and, and, and of the experience of, of how this program is really uh, leaving sort of the um, joint uh, UN reform and showing good, uh, good examples. So um, I think that's uh, from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sweden. What will you add to that, uh, Norway? What can you add to that? Well, I agree with everything that's been said, but maybe uh, on the more technical side that the joint program uh, increases the efficiency and impacts of uh, and um, also know that predictable and multi-year funding is really crucial for programs like this. So that, that's a reason for, for continue to support and other countries to, um, to join. And, and you know, uh, if you decide to support the program, you, you will support rural women in, in several countries and you will work with uh, excellent UN organizations and very dedicated staff. Mm -hmm. So, so I really believe that this uh, this program is a gift to all those countries um, who might be ready to put money behind their promises for women's economic empowerment. So, I leave it there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Norway and Sweden. I cannot thank you enough for staying with this program since 2014, supporting us not only with funding but also advocacy and also for the events like this. I thank you so much. And I still give you a gold star. I don't have it here, but I should give you next time I see you, I should give you a, a gold star. And then now we shall have a, a few minutes to take some questions. And the first question will go to Susan from FAO. How, how are you able to reach the most marginalized and vulnerable women? This question is for FAO. Susan, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kawinsky. Um, I think this is an important question because, uh, and it, it's something that the joint program has tackled right from the beginning. And what did we do? The first thing that was really important is targeting. You must target them so that you can find them. So target IDPs in Ethiopia, target lower caste, and then you go out and find them. And in, in some places, we even work with local, the local governments and local institutions to help us understand who are the most marginalized, who are the most vulnerable. So uh, the first thing is targeting. <clears throat> and then as we started to work with them, I, it's really important to talk about the, the integrated approach because these most vulnerable people suffer multiple uh they really have multiple constraints so you cannot only do one thing you, you have to work with them in terms of improving their agriculture skills you have to work with them in terms of their literacy and numeracy you can't run a business if you can't add up the numbers so you need to think about literacy numeracy skills training on markets understanding what the market wants um, we have to think about uh, the whole idea about organizing. When you work with really poor, marginalized people, women especially, they need to come together to support each other, to solve their problems together. And, uh, and one of the things that was done, I think it was in Ethiopia, was also to bring other women who had a bit more experience to mentor these very uh, marginalized uh, women. Um, before I finish, two more things I'd like to add, Kawinzi. I think leadership training, really important so that they're able to be heard, voices are heard, they're able to participate effectively in the organizations, in development processes, very important. And finally, just making sure that you actually use gender transformative approaches so that you, you're working with men and with uh, the norm holders in the community to also empower women. Thank you, Karen. Over to you. 
Thank you, Susan. And the second question will go to Stephen from IFAD. Stephen, when considering a second phase of the program, what will you change? What will you have and what will have added emphasis? Over to you, Stephen. Thank you very much, Kamizi. Um, so I guess a first thing, uh, very important, is something also mentioned before, uh, one of the lessons we learned from the COVID experience is really to integrate uh, more systematically a resilience lens, so across all program interventions, uh, which will then enable women and their households to anticipate and adapt and respond to all different kinds of uh, shocks or hazards like climate change, uh, disease outbreak, but also conflict, etc. So I think that will be a, a first element. Um, secondly, um, we also need to ensure that um, women's increased access to livelihoods and economic opportunities also contributes to efficient, uh, sustainable, inclusive and resilient uh, sustainable food systems. Um, and that's something we're also working on with the Committee on Food Security and the, the guidelines that are being prepared. So um, that is also very important. A third element um, would also be to give more attention to innovation and ICT and increasing women's access to ICT uh, through uh, digital literacy, uh, skills development, etc., so that they can really enhance access to economic opportunities. Um, then what would also be important is to uh, measure empowerment. Um, so in having a robust uh, ME framework that can help to um, harmonize tools for and, com and compare between different countries. And that's something we've now done with also the use of the Women's Empowerment in Agriculture Index. So uh, not in all countries that we have a baseline, but we're now Doing that for all the end lines, but it will be important to have a common measure of empowerment um, and integrate it systematically throughout the project cycle. Um, then also what will be important is South-South learning, um, so knowledge exchange, uh, sharing experiences between the different countries. So we've seen that we found that in a number of cases and that was has been very useful, so that is something that we'd like to, um, to do more of. And finally, in relation to policy and advocacy, also to uh, contribute more to policy dialogue and advocate for rural women's uh, rights and livelihoods at a global level. So I think those are the points that we would definitely like to uh, address more systematically in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. And now we have another question for Susan. How do we keep culture if that is what is holding women back? from making decisions, ETC. Over to you, Susan. Thank you, Kawinzi. So when we started to, to work around women's empowerment years ago, uh, everybody said, oh, but it's cultural. We cannot interfere with that. Oh, that's also cultural. And it, it really, it, everything you touched, you know, it, it food last was also cultural. Um, uh, not eating certain pieces of meat was cultural. So where, where could one start? And, and to tell you the truth, the agriculture has really come from, is very far behind. I think the, the people in health realize very quickly that we must figure out how to change behavior, how to, we must figure out how to intervene and, and change these discriminatory social norms. Um, what's really good now is that uh, from the field of agriculture, we've learned a lot from the other fields, these gender transformative approaches we are talking about. Uh, and, and the idea is to work with communities to figure out what is holding us all back. It's not only holding women back. If both women and men in the home cannot work together to see their visions, some of the approaches that uh, uh, Ifa talks about the gender action learning system says, okay, it's your work together. How, how can we build a vision as a home? And you start to talk with men and women. Uh, some of the approaches like the Dimitra clubs are coming together. They are men and women and they're saying, do we want our girls to be married early? How is this affecting our own well-being and our own livelihoods? And 
we are having these conversations. What I think is really important is that now we, we are beginning to see methods and approaches for tackling these norms in a way where there is a win-win for everybody. You know, you're not taking away from men so that women win. The community conversations in uh, Ethiopia, same issue. You bring them up and you discuss with the community and you find out what are the win-win solutions if the whole community, the whole the family needs to move forward. And what's important is to recognize that you, you're not taking away from the women to give to the men, but you're working together for the well-being of the household. So I think these approaches are really, really important. Thank you. Over to you, Kawinzi. Thank you, uh, Susan, and thank you, Stephen. This is a wonderful joint program. You have heard that we have a measurable impact. You have heard that it has built resilience. You have heard that we have results we can uh, put on the table. You have heard our gold star partners, Norway and Sweden, give us testimony about it. I know there are areas we need to, to improve, but really it's a wonderful program. And I hope moving forward to the next phase, we'll have more partners joining us. Thank you so much for giving us this time today and being with us today. And we look forward to seeing you again in the next event. And yes, the PowerPoint will be shared with everybody. I thank you so much. Thank you and stay safe. Goodbye.